Today, I'm gonna to show you how I orchestrate, but this is not gonna be about any of the creative things I do, deciding on dynamics, voicings, or adding notes and fleshing out harmony and chords. This is just the technical side, how I get from MIDI file to score. You can see here, I have a folder, and I've got the, all the files for one cue from a, this is from a TV show, it's a little short cue, small orchestra, so it's gonna be easy to do. Uh, I have a MIDI file, a mix, and then some stems. I used to just take this MIDI file and then throw it into Finale. Import, and you'll see why I don't like to do this now. You can see we've got some notes starting before, ending after. We've got what looks like a bit of a cluster here that probably shouldn't be there. And generally, it's a mess. We've got a key switch here. Now, if that was in the middle of this, it would make this a total disaster. Um, you could manipulate the quant settings in Finale and bring it in a little cleaner, but you still have to delete some of these things. And it's way easier to do that in a door than it is in Finale without screwing it up. You see, it's a tie there that shouldn't be there. All right, so let's get out of here, go back to DP. So I use Digital Performer for this. So I'm going to throw the MIDI file there. Say OK. Now I need to save this before I can go further. I can go File, Save As, or I like to press the magic button. And now it's gone to the correct folder. For each project, I have a folder, or each episode uh, would have the name here. I've got a DP folder, a Scores folder, and a Sketches folder. I have the asterisk just because it means the folders are always going to go up the top and they're easy to find if you end up with other junk in the folder. So let's put that in there. Now anytime I open a DP file, until I change it, it's going to go to that folder. Uh, that lives, all of that stuff's living in Dropbox and my whole team is sharing that so we can all start and finish and hand off projects and stay in sync with each other. And the files are always backed up to multiple computers and the cloud and you can go back in time if you screw something up. So it, it's a really important thing to have backups. I also run Time Machine on this computer um, for other backups. So files are everywhere. Okay, so I've got this file in here and it's saved. So now I can throw the audio in. So while that loads, I'll tell you a bit about why I'm working from a MIDI file and not the original file. So I could get the composer's Cubase, Logic, DP or Pro Tools file, uh, but if I tried to open that on my system, it would be a mess. It would look for all their plugins, all of the pro instances, and audio, and picture, and all sorts of junk that I don't need to worry about. So I just get a MIDI file. And I always ask that they send me a MIDI file that they haven't done anything to. It's exactly as it was printed. It's just exported right away. I don't like them to clean up anything, delete things they don't think I need to see, or quantize, because it's really easy for a tired composer or an inexperienced assistant to do the wrong thing. So I like to get it and I'll deal with it myself. I get a mix and then I also get stems. Most of the time I'm dealing with the mix, but if I need to investigate the music further, uh, something I can't hear properly, I think there might be something wrong or misprinted or there's a gesture that's a one shot that I have to transcribe, I will refer to the stems. At a minimum, I like to get the winds, brass, um, keyboards, percussion, strings, and then other stuff. Uh, this composer prints out uh, more of the string splits because, you know, in TV with a small orchestra, we sometimes blend them back in, so he wants to have as much control as possible. But that doesn't affect me at all. So now you can see, if I go up here, I've got everything loaded. And I'll save. So here is my file. Plays back. I'm lucky this composer prints everything from the start. Some people print it from somewhere else and you have to then spot it and make sure they're in the right place and it can be a bit of a pain. But luckily for me, this guy does it the easy way. All right, so I need to just tidy this up a little bit. Let's do some housekeeping. This, this is completely just to make life a little easier. On this small queue, it really is not gonna do much. But on a bigger queue with hundreds of tracks, it's a good idea to be organized. Okay, so we've tried doing this in every program. There is the MIDI cleanup, and we found DP the best for a couple of reasons. The main one being it has 
the ability to have multiple files inside the one file. So you can go here, duplicate chunk, and make another copy of this in the same file. Why we do that is that I want to have a copy of the composer's original work to refer to, but I need to actually start cleaning and manipulating this before I export it into another MIDI file and into Finale. So if I duplicate it, I can work on one version preserving the original. So I have a quick key, and I press the magic button, and voila. Now you'll see I have the original and the cleanup. Now these are identical because I haven't made any changes yet. So I'm going to leave the original there and I'm going to start working on the cleanup. Now I would do this a little more carefully if I was really doing it and I'd be listening to each section as I went along. Uh, but right now I'm just going to do it sort of fast and nasty. So I need to, to start quantizing MIDI. So let's look at the woodwinds. Okay, this is pretty easy to see. Uh, you can see here that these notes are starting before and before and there may be some little overlaps. Uh, no, these are all before. But we need to get them back on the beat. There's a really cool feature of DP called Smart Quantize here. I want to make sure you've got Quantize Attacks and Duration set so it does the start and the end of the note. And then hit Apply. And voila, see it's cleaned everything up. Undo. I do it this way. I use my left hand on my jog and hit this button and that brings up the window and this one does okay. Uh, that makes life easier because I use this thing to scroll through so I can do a lot of things without moving my hands. Uh, I have this setup I've come up with over the years means my hands move less so I can just shift over with my pinky, thumb, left here. If you've got the big keyboard you've got to move hands all over the place and they get sore when you sit here for 12 hours. All right, so I've cleaned the woodwinds. Now let's look at the harp. Smart quantize. Okay, you can see that this note here is long. I want to make that an eighth note. So I just did a change duration um, and quick keys did it and I have sh different shortcut keys to change different durations. Uh, makes life easy. There's no other harp. Let's look at the piano. Okay, this show we don't record live piano. We leave it as samples but I like to put it in my score so that we can see what's going on. So I'm just making that a whole note and then I know if I make this note a quarter note it will come in a little easier and then the rest we can fix later. Now I'm looking at this and it just doesn't look right because it looks like it's starting on beat 4 but it probably should be on beat 1 so let's check out this cue. Look, we got all this stuff starting on beat 4. We got a tempo change on beat 4. So something slipped when the composer was writing. This happens a lot. Um, you know, composers are thinking about other things, not so much the, uh, the metering. So it's a good idea to really check for these things, and we often have to rebar the music. So all I have to do is work out what's going on, and I think it's a 3-4 bar here and then we should be good. But I want to remind myself later that I've done this uh, so I can tell the composer. So I'm going to make another copy here and call it rebar. So I hit the rebar button. What I've also done is saved a variable in quick keys which is like a clipboard clipping and it will paste that into my score later so we'll, we'll know that this is a rebar cue and we won't forget because it's not fun to get to the session and not have told them what you've done and notice that you're now off with the counter and all hell breaks loose because no one can remember what happened. So let's rebar this thing. Bar 22 needs to be a 3-4. So let's spot to there, click there, then we come over here, meter change, add it, 22, oops, 3-4. All right, done. Now we check it. Looks good. Move back onto the grid. We're on the grid. Okay, we did it. So and that piano looks much healthier now. So let's have a look at these strings now. So we've got ensemble patches. This is quite common. 
very few composers actually, you know, write out violin one, violin two, viola, cello, bass, uh, due to the way they program. Uh, and even if they do, I honestly I change it a lot because they're not sort of thinking the way I am. Um, we're looking at the whole picture, so I don't take it too seriously when they when they do do that anyway. So I'm just going to select all of this here and try smart quantize and hope for the best. And it worked. Perfect. Ah, you can see over here it didn't. So in that case, well, let's go for a normal quantize and we'll fix that. All right. Let's just, let's just quantize all of this stuff before we do anything else. Quantize. Only work on what you can see because you don't want to screw something up or miss something. Okay, so this one didn't go, so let's do a normal quantize for that one. Okay, um, another, this is a harmonics track. Okay, this, it went the wrong way. So smart quantize is fairly smart, but not foolproof. That's why you always work on what you can see so you can fix things out. Okay, here's a key switch. We want to get rid of that, or well, that could make a mess later. All right, so now I've done the strings. A little trick, you can see here I've got multiple parts going. If I split this out, it'll come in to Finale much better and be easier for us to work with. So let's add some extra tracks. I could start working on other existing tracks here, but I don't want to screw this up and it's not going to be too complicated. So here's one of the cool things, another cool thing with DP. I can grab all these notes. So I've selected them down here and you can see they're highlighted here. And I just drag them down. Other programs you have to do cut and copy and paste and all this sort of stuff, and it's just not as easy. All right. So now you can see I've split the music onto three staves tracks, and it's going to be much easier to work with. All right. We have a synth up here um, that I'm just going to give a rough quantize to as well. So that comes in neat, and we should be good. I think I covered everyone. All right. I would have listened to this much more closely as I went through if this was if I was doing this for real. All right. So now we need to get this out of here. We need to export it to Finale. Ordinarily, that would involve saving as a MIDI file, opening the MIDI file in Finale, and then you have to save it and name it and everything. And that can be a real problem at 3 a.m. Uh, it's really easy to screw up the naming or save things into wrong folders. So that's why I have quick keys do it and everything is assigned to the correct folder. So I'm going to press the button that says export MIDI. And now I have this step here where I can put the file name. I can edit the file name if I want to. Sometimes they'll put for Tim or for orchestration or something in the name and I don't need that anymore. This one doesn't have it, so I'm okay. So that's the new name. It's going to save as a MIDI file. Okay, now what's happened is we've gone to Finale and we've highlighted through the, uh, it, it searches, it pastes that, the file name in through that variable into here and then I can find it and open it. All right, so a couple of things about the import MIDI file options. You want to turn off all these things. You don't want any of this junk in there. It can corrupt your file. If you start copying and paste things, you know, in your file later, it will sort of half copy this stuff and then it can just get really ugly. So I just make sure all that's off. Make sure this is off, otherwise anything on channel 10 will be a percussion stave or multiples of 10. Okay, so let's have a look at our quant settings. That looks good. You want this to be one more than your smallest duration. And then more settings. And you want zero, convert to real notes, because you don't want grace notes. You want minimize rest, allow dot rest and compound meters is fine, and voice two. You don't want any of these. We just want sort of the black and white. Okay, so let's go, okay. You can see down the bottom, it says subscopes off. If you watch what I was doing when I was in that window, I managed to press Q and I went into that quantize window and then M for more settings. That's called a subscope in quick keys. So what it did was it went to a new set of, uh, of shortcuts for, that are task specific. So I have a bunch of subscopes that, it, that I can go into and do various things. And it just makes life easier You'll notice I don't have any menus. Uh, sorry, I don't go to menus much in Finale, and I don't have any tool palettes open. Um, everything's got a shortcut, which makes life much easier and much faster. So let's have a look here. So now I've got this file, and it's looking much cleaner than it did before, but I don't have any names, and we're untitled. So I need to name it. I need to put it in the correct folder. 
and I need to you know do some housekeeping. So let's go and press this magic button. And it's going to save, put the name in, put the word rebar in, and then go to the sketches folder. And that was the correct sketch folder for this project. So I'll have a different uh, shortcut so I can have three different projects on at once with different shortcuts and it will they all have their correctly assigned folders. You'll notice it turned the rests off too. I'm allergic to rests in scores. So now it's nice and clean. I can see what's going on and I can start to clean up this MIDI. All right, so let's put some double bars. Uh, we should probably listen, but I reckon that's a good place for another one. And then maybe let's put another one here. All right, that's good. And then let's put one here. I love double bars in recording sessions. It means the parts are going to break in the right place and it's easy to find places to stop and start. So you can never have too many. All right, so now we need to do some organization. I need to put brackets around these so I can see what my groups are. So I have a, I go F3, A, B, um, which is using a thing called sticky keys in quick keys and allows me to make a bracket around the staves. F3, A, B. You can see the keys pop up here that I type. All right, so here's my strings, all of these, which we're gonna con condense down. Okay, now I would do this while I was listening a lot as well. Um, for the moment, I'm just going to uh, power through. Okay, so one thing we need to note, this is all muted, so I'll just pop that so we know. And then we wanna get this on the least number of staves possible. So let's pop you up there, and then we can delete. Now I'm looking at this here, and we shouldn't have a G flat there. That should be an F sharp. So I need to change it to sharps and respell the notes. Let's get you up there. And then uh, we could probably even, let's merge this up here. This is just to get it down doesn't really matter so much in this queue because it's kind of not a lot of notes going on um, but you know I like to have the sketch condensed so I can see what's really going on and then I'll decide how to voice it out later so I want to get these notes up onto this stave that would involve you know uh, changing the layers going to view uh, active layer only and all that I've got this little shortcut I made and it does it for me. So now you can see I've got what was on four staves or five or something like that down to two. Okay, so let's get that note up there. Let's get these, oops, get these notes down here. Okay, I need to make that sharps again. Done. Okay, so here's a harmonic. So what I wanna do is make all the notes in this track, because it was all harmonics, have a harmonic circle so I know later on, if I paste stuff around, they were harmonics. So I have a quick key that goes and applies an articulation to that. Now that's the only harmonic in the piece, so it doesn't really matter. So when it comes to the sketch, I could either put that up there, or in this case, I could just say plus harmonic. And that will be good enough. Now I can delete that, and let's check the rest of the track, no notes. We're good to go. All right, let's keep going. So we've got these notes here. Um, they should go up into treble clef. Now I want to get these notes down the bottom. So what I'm going to do is a few little plugins will help me out here. I want to get rid of the third voice. And then now I want to get rid of the second voice. So now I've isolated all that. And then you can see that this is in fact a duplicate of that. It's quite common. Um, you know, I see a lot of orchestrators see duplicates and they'll actually write it out twice with different instructions because one was a mute, one was a not mute, or one was a saltasto and one was not. Uh, that's completely ridiculous. Um, you know, composers do lots of things with MIDI files and samples just to make it sound as good as they can. Your job is to, you know, work out what it should be in the real world. Um, 
so I never take it too seriously. All right. So another cool uh, thing that I do all the time, uh, let's imagine that this was actually uh, a tremolo track. It's quite common that a composer will have, have that. So, and let's just put a few more notes in so that we can see what will happen when I do this. Okay, so now I've got a mixture of durations. So what I can do is just select the whole track and run this thing here. It's gonna go through and find all the durations and mark them as tremolo. And then it offsets everything and makes sure we've got the right uh, beaming, uh, the right uh, tremolo thing, because by default Finale has a problem with differentiating that one and that one. Okay, so a couple of things. One, let's get rid of these ties. Uh, you do not need ties on tremolos in strings. Uh, and then the other thing, just note that the reason why I did that and didn't just swipe it off with one thing is you only need three lines for a tremolo. So on the eighth notes we need two, and on the sixteenth we need one, and then the rest we need three. I know that other program seems to think you need four, but that is wrong. This is correct. It is just three. And doesn't matter. They will play that unmeasured. I guarantee it, and they will never re-articulate that. I will guarantee it. But that was just an extra track that we were mucking around with, so we can get rid of that. And now we can get rid of that track. Now, I have a shortcut to do that, otherwise you'd have to sort of like go over and do something weird and click here, I think. I know, I actually forget how to do things manually a lot of the time because I'm so used to doing them, doing them my way. So let's just have a quick listen to the end of this. Um, so you can see they're, they're out before that last note, so I don't need to worry. Uh, I work with three monitors here. I have the middle one is what we're looking at. The left one has DP on it. And the right one has my iChat and email and file browsers and everything. Um, so I can look at the file at the same time. I can't stand working on one monitor. So I'm just gonna delete, um, delete all of that. And so now I can Let's compress this. All right, so now let's see if we got everything down. And we did. We can delete those tracks. So we managed to squash it down to two. Um, I probably wouldn't have bothered to go that far on this, but I was just showing you how, how you can do it and then how much easier it is to orchestrate once you can actually just see the exact chords and, and what, what the composer wanted. So let's have a look at the woodwinds. The harp looks good. The woodwinds look good. Um, at the end here, we've got an alto flute. So I'm gonna pop that up there and call this alto. Okay, you notice I just call it alto because this is the flute part. They do not play alto saxophone on this uh, or alto recorder or anything else. So I just call it the alto and they haven't made a mistake yet. Um, okay, let's delete that. All right, so now we've got down to our three woodwinds, our harp, our piano. Let's just have a look at how that came in. All right, so let's just tidy that a little bit. So one key. What do I do? I hit the wrong key again, not looking in the right place. And then do the same here. All right. As I said, we don't record this, but I put it in the score so we can see what's going on. And if we want to double it or whatever, it'll be there. But now we've got a good tidy sketch. Uh, the last thing we need to do is get the tempo information. So I'm looking at my DP file. Okay, so this starts actually at 72.5. Now, no player gives a rat about the 0.5. And it's all gonna be in the Pro Tools session and all of that sort of stuff. So let's not worry about the 0.5. We will just put 73 and no one will care. All right, so then we come along and in uh, 21, we slow down by one BPM. So my shorthand is just to write minus one. 
Now you could put slightly slower minus one, but the minute you say slightly slower, everyone's gonna go for a much bigger slowdown than minus one. So that's what I put and it works. Um, probably wouldn't do it if I was running a concert work, but in the studio, it works well. All right, in 24, we have another slowdown. We'll go down two more BPM. And then at 26, we go down again, another one. You can see I use quick keys to get through to the correct uh, category. If I go in here manually, you can see I have my own category. It's got tempo marks. Then I have fixed above, normal above, italic above, italic below, quiet dynamics, hidden, all these sorts of things. And depending on what quick key I trigger, I wanted to type a word here. I go command tilde three, and whatever I type will go into the category for fixed above. And if I do here, whatever I type will come out italic below. Okay, so this is set to go on a staff set of above the score and above the violin, uh, as is that that first tempo mark. Um, and these other ones are just going to go on the individual stave. All right, so we're basically done. So now we need to get this into our score. So for years, I was trying to find the best way to do this. I really wanted to have my score and sketch in the one file. And I finally cracked it using this thing called the score merger. Now I'm gonna use it in a way that's not really designed to. So it's a little funky and you have to know what it's gonna screw up for you, but it's awesome once you get your head around it. What you do is you add files. So you're gonna add the sketch file and you're gonna add your score template file, um, and then you're going to merge them. Now this is designed to either put them put files like movements one after the other, or put parts into a score. So you will be putting things, um, you know, back together. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put two scores together. Now, a couple of things with that. My template, if we find it in here in uh, is okay so that looks that's my nice clean template everything's set up ready to go uh, but it's in 4.4 so that's going to be a problem when we do the merge so this is in 3.4 so the quick key the first thing it's going to do is actually insert a 4.4 and then the merge will work if you don't it'll crash took us a while to work out why Okay, so the thing I need to note is that we start in bar nine because we're going to lose these bars. Some orchestrators leave them, does my head in. I don't know, let's start at the beginning because when you're on the session, you can say from the top and that is the top, the first note. You know, we don't need to see all of these. Lots of composers start at bar five and I see plenty of scores where they leave one, two, three, four in there for no reason. I think some orchestrators think they're going to get paid for those four bars, honestly. They're not. Um, anyway, I'm going to start at bar nine. So... Here we go. Let's run this next quick key. It's adding the bar for 4-4. Four, four. It's grabbing all the information. It's grabbed the template. Now it's found the sketch folder and it's it, if there was multiple sketches in there, it would have found the correct one for me. But just I can I have it wait there just so I can make sure it don't screw up. Now it's naming the score and it's got the word score at the end and it's gone to the scores folder and again it waits for me just in case I've screwed it up. All right, so now it's just gone and deleted that, that bar so we're back to where we were. So if you look here, I have the score. Now it looks a little ugly, I've got all these time signatures and measure numbers, which I don't need. So I'm going to run a little quick key. It's going to tidy that up for us. And then if we go to the end, another side effect of this is it adds double the number of bars. We just get rid of that. Now you can see we have a nice tidy score, but we don't have any information in here yet and we haven't offset our bars. So I'm going to run another quick key. It's going to ask me for the start bar. 
9. Let's paste in the information in. See, we've got our rebar text. And then I need to grab this out. Paste that there. And then I can add any other text in here if I want. Go OK. All right, so now what it's done, you can see I've got my correct labeling. I've got the word rebar. And I've highlighted the first nine bars so I can delete them. And I'm now starting at bar nine. So a couple other things you'll notice. I have these extra regions in here. So there's the main measure region, and there's another one that I can put on any staves I want. If I come in here and do that, it'll appear here. So when you're looking like this and you're scrolling up and down, you can always find where you are. Because sometimes, well, this is a small one, but well, look, yeah, the real measure numbers are off the page. Um, so now, and you can see my text that I put in earlier is above the top and the violin. So you can see my template, small orchestra, three, three winds, harp, my guide staves, which is going to be the piano or any synths or keyboards or important things that we need to know about, and then the string staves. So it's a small orchestra, 11 violins, five viola, four celli, two basses. Uh, this is hidden text, so I can see it, but when we print it out, it's not going to show. I use a lot of hidden text in names for reminders to myself and it makes life easier. Okay, I also have it set so that uh, these are extra staves. So um, when I say hide staves later, this one will disappear, this one will disappear, this one will disappear, and this one if there's no notes in them. Quite often you need two staves to write something out neatly. It might be two parts and you can't fit it on one, whatever. So I have them in the template and then I'll just hide them later. I never delete anything, I just hide things. Um, and these staves, my sketch, which is down the bottom, I will hide later. So it's always going to be there. I can reference it at the session if I need to, uh, but it's never in the way. All right. Another thing in uh, Hollywood, we copy all the violins together on the one part. So that's why it's just called violin. So I think still in violin one and two, um, but some people think in a big blob. And that way you can do a true three-way split and we can revoice things and rebalance chords on the fly with the, uh, with the strings. Uh, I don't recommend writing like that if you're recording with an orchestra that's not used to reading like that because you will have you know, people trying to divide things that they shouldn't divide. Um, but if you're working in, uh, in Hollywood or London are used to it as well, you can write like this. Okay, so let's start orchestrating. You will have noticed possibly that I'm using Finale 2011 still, even though the current version is 2014. And this is the reason. There's this thing called reorder staves, which they screwed up in the new version. You can't do groups anymore. You can only move individual staves. And my whole process is based around doing this. I'm going to move up the woodwinds, and I'm going to make sure that my strings are just below my strings. So when I work, I can see the sketch and the woods, and I can see the sketch and the strings. If I had brass, I would move the brass into the middle as well, so I can see everything while I work. Um, this is really simple and transparent, but if you had lots more staves and it was more complicated, this way of working means you can keep this intact, always check against it, and then do your orchestrating in here. And then later, we'll just push this stuff out of the way back down. Okay, so but this is quite a simple and straightforward cue. So I'm just gonna grab these and drop them in, right? And let's just check it that that's all there is to do okay, as I said this cue I picked because it's all about the technical stuff not about deciding on voices or or all that sort of stuff <laughs> okay so our woodwinds are basically done the notes are in we'll worry about dynamics later all right so let's check the strings well first of all let's dump dump the harp and then we can grab uh, our piano and put it into the guide staves. Okay, so now I got that I can move this out out of the way. All right, so now I'm back and we can see what's going. Okay, so I'm just going to show move this over here for a minute. Uh, this normally lives on the other monitor, but I want to show you how I have this set up. Another thing I worked on for years was being able to play DP in the background while 
I was doing stuff up here. Stop and start it. So I'm using this jog shuttle here that sends a key command out of the driver up here that is intercepted by this program called Bohm's MIDI translator that then turns the key command into a MIDI note that DP listens to in the background and plays and stops. It sounds complicated and it is, but it works. Okay, uh, while I'm at it, the iPad here sends key commands to a program called Osculator, which we don't need to worry about that. And let's get, so you can see when I tap buttons, it sends that. So this sends MIDI notes to quick keys to trigger things all in the background. All right, so while I'm going through here, I'm gonna be doing a lot of listening, okay? Not so much right now, but ordinarily I'm listening the whole time to get dynamics and articulations and the shaping and everything. So I wanna be able to get through quickly so you can scroll, play, stop, and then I can just click, click back. And then I don't have to go back to DP to stop. See, I'm still in finale. That took me years to work out. All right, I'm gonna put uh, DP back over there and maximize you. All right, so now we're back. So I would uh, be doing a lot more listening if I was doing this for real. Anyway, let's, let's get some orchestrating done or at least some pasting. The more you can do by pasting notes around, the better and the less chance you have of screwing it up. Um, all right. So I had a listen to that just a second ago, and I reckon they just come in at pianissimo. Okay, you're gonna get a little crescendo naturally, so we don't need to put it in. Um, the engineers on these things also tend to fade things in even more, so you don't have to worry. Okay, so let's have you at P, and then our next thing that's gonna come in Okay, so let's work on the strings. So, okay, so I just exploded that out. Uh, I'm gonna use the violas and violin two here. It'll be a slightly, you know, back sound because I won't have my first sitting right at the front playing and then they can come in here on this melodic idea. And I'm gonna have all the violins play that's quite acceptable. It's really common to have, you know, 32 violins versus eight violas playing a harmony note. That is not a problem. They're on the top. They're the most important. Okay, so let's get some more shaping into this phrase. So what do we need to do? Okay, so let's go P, P to P. I need to go up and then it'll go down. Now I've got multiple ways I can put in crescendos and diminutive notes. Um, the easy way, or the not the easy way, but the, the hand way is to do this, right? You can see I just go control S. Well, actually I go function because I remapped my function key. I also remapped this option to be a um, an enter. But uh, so it's control. Anyway, so control S for slur, control C for crescendo, control D for diminuendo, control, uh, and then if I want to put in a half note trill, I held H, W for whole note, all that sort of stuff. All right, but the other ways I can put this in, there's another thing that I use, is this JW plugin that you can select a whole duration and have it do all these cool things. Uh, which I'm experimenting with. Uh, the other way I have of doing things is I have what I call my hairpin paster. So if I come over here, set the filter. We're in three, four and I want two bars. Let's just say I want to go with a dynamic at the beginning and one at the middle and then there's that. And you see it drop that in. Now it just saves a lot of time and when that bar gets a little wider, it won't touch. 
the problem is when you're working like this, you tend to have too many gaps. Uh, this won't have it. Anyway, I'm going to get rid of that. Go back to that page. Sometimes I work with two iPads, um, but the other one is in the house. All right, so let's get back to here. So then we're going to grab this information, put it there. Okay, now these guys don't need the P because they've already got it. I'll just drag that back a little bit. And let's uh, paste that, that to there and tidy it. All right, so I'm using the TG Move Align to move things up and down. I remap the keys. It was something over here, and it's two hands, so I have it here. So I can use one hand because that's like go-to thing. I need to tell them all to play with mutes. Okay, and now we've got that first bit. So we need the woodwinds. Um, I'm going to slur this for the woodwinds. And then we're going to have a little crescendo up here. So I can take... It's good to steal as much as you can. So I can steal that from there. I can steal that from, from there. And then he here, we're going to actually use the same stuff. So let's align this. And this one is going to be a Poco crescendo. Okay, one little, little thing is that if I left that off, the Poco, they would go way too far on this. If I left that off, the P, they would go way too far. They go too dynamics. Even now, they're going to exaggerate this too much. So I use a lot of Poco uh, crescendo. Just, you know, we still have to tell them to shut up sometimes, but at least we know what we want. All right, so you can see I'm doing a lot of filtering to move stuff around. I have it set up that um, I have a lot of pre-programmed ones. So if I do F5, F5, I'm going to move everything except the notes. So I'll move that slur, I'll move any articulations. Blah, blah. But uh, if I wanted to move this down here, I don't want the slur. So then I go F5, 5, and it just picked the hairpins and the expressions. Now, if I want something else, I'm now in a subscope and I can type A for articulation, L for lyric, uh, C for chord, H for hairpin, whatever. And when I get out of there, that's the setting that's gonna stick for a while. And then if I wanna move everything, I hit F2 and filter is off. Um, all right, so let's move on to the next phrase. Let's have a little listen. Okay, so let's get these notes up. Oh, we already pasted them up there. So you're going to go there. I need to get the bottom note here. So I need to get rid of the third note on this one. And I need to explode that. All right, a little bug that I just forgot about. If you explode with a uh, score expression, it's going to create some extra bizarre list. So I'll do this another way. I will extract the notes down to just the bottom note. And here, I want just the bottom note again. All right. Now let's double cello here, but they are going to split off here and play this. All right, so here I don't need that lower note, and in fact I don't want, I want to put in an extra note there, so let's do this. Uh, get that out of the way, and we can swap that layer. All right, so now I've got that. Let's get the top note. Now I'll paste down three beats. Now I'll do my layer paste out thing again. And voila, we've got, got that. Now I should have uh, pasted in the note for him, but let's do it this way. Let's go to that, flip it, get rid of that. Now I've got the notes. Okay, I do as much as I can with uh, copying and pasting than as I can, you know, because I'm going to screw up otherwise. So let's put in some slurs for him. All right, so what dynamic we're going to go with here? Let's have another listen to that phrase. Okay, 
So I'm going to give a mezzo piano. It definitely speaks louder. Mezzo piano is this weird dynamic. No one really knows what to do. So they always start a little softer and get louder as they go. So I'm naturally going to get that crescendo without having to ride it. Um, another thing I noticed is this actually, we could put a comma here if we want. I mean, they're going to have to break, but these guys won't have to break so much. So these guys might naturally go a little longer. So let's give them all an eighth note. So we don't have to worry. So what I'm going to do here is reduce that one, then use another JW plugin. And paste the duration. I used quick keys to do it, of course. It's the um, I can't even remember the name, Pat Copy or something. And I set that as the duration, and then I can paste that to any any notes. Um, and magic, we get what we need. All right. So now let's continue. What are we up to? Okay, we need. I think there's a little swell swell on this note here. Uh, 21. Okay, we've got a swell on diminuendo. So we can put our diminuendo in. Oopsie daisy. Alright, let's shrink that down a little bit. And then we're going to put a little crescendo here and make it a poco one. Okay, and I need that into all the other parts. Filter, paste, paste, paste. And then we need to do the align. These ones are all similar distance. This one needs to come down a little bit. And that one can go up a little bit. All right, I think we've got that. All right, so this little bit here, I am going to put the harmonic as well. I always write my harmonics out, various reasons explained in my blog, but um, that's my process. Hit the harmonic button, runs a combination of quick keys and plugins with settings, and now I've got the fingering. Give them a, a dynamic. Okay, so here we've got, let's just drop all these notes down so we don't forget anything. All right, you guys, the violas can have that. Okay, so the violas just gonna play the top because obviously they can't play the, the A. Mind you, it wouldn't be the first person to write an A for the violas. And then let's add the basses. Oh, wrong note, sorry. Let's add the basses on the A. I'll put that up. Okay, the reason why I've got the cello split on that C sharp is the violas down low like this. They're very, it's a very strident, um, penetrating sound. It doesn't blend at all. Uh, if I had more cello, I would just have cellos do it, or I would do what I'm going to do and have half and half play, because that just is just a really hard thing to blend. Um, but if I do that, um, I'm sort of going to soften the sound there. So let's give them some dynamics. Let's have a listen. Let's see what we've got. So that's about 24. Okay, so we're soft and we have a little crescendo here. Okay, so we're gonna go up one dynamic. Now let's, sometimes it's easier to put these things in if you make the bar wider. Here we are, print that, and then we can grab that, pop it down there, and we'll give that. I've, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, I like to be as ergonomic as possible. So all my shortcuts for tools are on the left here. So escape obviously is selection tool. Uh, tilde gets you to expression. Tab I remapped to get me to articulation. Uh, if I hit F1 twice, I'm gonna end up in the staff tool, uh, and then Control S gets me to the smart shape tool. Everything is is here. I don't have to move over and swap. I know people use F keys, but you've got to move too far. Um, I also then have things set up here. So when I want to do the octave stuff, I can just shift my pinky over. Um, I have six goes down, seven goes up, nine will add an octave. So let's put that back. All right, let's just continue. I'd probably be a little quicker 
in this if I wasn't yakking so much. Let's put in a diminuendo there. Drop that there. All right, so now we need to split this for our, um, first of all, we're gonna want that phrase. It's a very small section. So I can use the violas to help out on this. All right, and then now I want to split that into three. And we got that. So now let's paste that down there. We need to get rid of that third note. We need just the bottom note. And then we need to pop it up the octave. So we now have the exact stuff we need. All right, let's have a listen and see. So 27. All right, so it swells up. Let's make this a little bigger to make it easier. So let's go this and this. and we'll slur it. So now I need to get that into my other parts. Boom, boom. This is actually quite a nice sound when you do this and have the violas in this range doubling the, the violins. It really it thickens it up nicely. Um, okay, so now I have basically the same thing. I could do this, but that's pointless because they already know what dynamics to play. Plus, if we decide that I got it wrong here, and I've gone and pasted the same junk into this bar, they've got to change it in two places. So let's just take the, um, in this case, we just want to take the slur and the hairpins, right? And then I can move that back a little bit. I know it's kind of pointless, but I'm pedantic. And then, so I'll realign, and then I can just, it's probably quicker just to paste this down and realign it. Now this guy here needs the full information because he hasn't played yet. So he can have all of that. And then let's quick listen at the end. Okay, so I reckon that's what that is. I need to get that information down. Um, I'm going to have you, Viola's, join in on that. Uh, they can have all the same information here. And then I just need to get this into here. All right, so now we just check alignments, you move down. I'll just get it visually pleasing. Okay. So now we should have our strings completely done. So we need to check it, make sure we didn't miss anything. Uh, I've still got layer two hidden. Um, a lot of people would see this and they would want that to poco in or crescendo in. The basses are going to hear what's going on and they are totally going to blend in. In fact, they will play that softer to blend in because they have ears and they are not a computer. All right, so we should be good to go with the strings. Harp's good. Uh, we did our woods at the top. Um, now let's just finish them off here. Just gonna, uh, let's just get rid of that for the moment. And then uh, we need this information. can take the same information here, except you do not bow, so you can slur those notes. It's a pet peeve of mine when people copy and paste bowing to woodwinds. All right, so we're basically done. Let me just put the word alto back. Because it's so easy, I often end up just retyping things as opposed to finding the original. All right, 
So we've got our piano guide in there. You can see what's going on. We've got our tempo. Let's put this at six free in three, four. Um, technically, they don't have to play in time, so three would be enough. The problem is they're never going to be ready in time because you're always going to get those smart asses that don't think they have to get ready, and then they'll get their violin up at the last minute and there'll be some noise. So you need to give them a bit of time. All right, so I think we are pretty much done. Okay, uh, just a couple of little things that I didn't that didn't come up in this queue that I didn't get to show you uh, that I use. Let's say I needed to transpose this. Um, I can't even remember how you do it. There's a transpose feature somewhere, but I go um, Option T. Let's say I want that up a minor third, then I type M I three, and then hit Enter, and see it went up a minor third. If I wanted to add a fifth to that, I would go Option T, then hit five. Now that's going up. If I want down, I hit D. Again, I'm in a subscope. And let's say I wanted to add it. I hit P and it will preserve. So all these little things just to make life easier. Uh, anyway, I think I've covered most of my little tricks. Um, as I said, this is like a really simple cue and we didn't have to make a lot of orchestration decisions or fill in or flesh out. It's a, you know, it was really well written, perfectly written for the ensemble we had. Uh, I do a lot of shows with small orchestras and the composers you know don't think so much about the actual orchestra and they write millions more notes but um, on this particular show uh, the composer knows what we're doing and you know doesn't expect me to somehow make uh, 11 violins sound like 30. okay so now I've got to finish this off I've got to lay it out and get it into page view you notice I haven't looked in page view yet I never go to page view until the very end. So first thing, we need to get rid of these staves because we don't need to see them anymore. Okay, so what I'm going to do is hide them. So I go here, force hide. They are not going to show up in page view anymore, but they're still there. So on the session, if I've got to check a note, it's there. Uh, another advantage to this is I've had a couple of occasions where we have not you know they've said at the beginning of the project oh no harp okay samples for the harp and then at the last minute they're like we want harp live and you know it might not be enough time for me to go and do it the stuff might have been copied already i can just say to the copyists or you know one of my assistants grab the harp and put it put it in and find the dynamic so this system is awesome for keeping track and and for proofreading too when i send this off to my proofreader which i do every queue um he will, oh, I just noticed we didn't add, I didn't have uh, layer two active when I ran that uh, script. So let me just fix that one. Uh, another thing I like to have the uh, rests joined up. It's not a deal breaker, but it just makes life easier, Le neater. Um, uh, when, when this goes to my proofreader or if someone else is orchestrating a queue for me, it's very easy for me to compare what the source was and what they did. And it's really easy to find uh, wrong notes or things that we need to change. Okay, so now the finishing off of this queue. Uh, a couple of things with MIDI files into Finale. There's some bugs still where if you had a note that started slightly before the beat, it might miss the accidental on the note. Or you have these phantom ties that when you go over a little bit, um, well, they are tied notes, but sometimes you might see this note here has a tie and there is no note before it. Uh, so there's a couple of utilities you can run uh, called, uh, where is it? Change, no, um, I don't do this manually, so I've got no idea. Check notation, check ties, check accidentals. And then I run check durations as well, which is a plugin to make sure I haven't added beats or missed beats. So let's do that. So we can just, so normally I would just do it from here. I go F6 TT for check ties. It's going to run those plugins and then it's told me it's checked no problems with durations. Okay, so now I need to do cautionary accidentals. So F6 CA. And we're done. Now it's taken us into page view. So we can lay it out now. So let's just uh, see how we want to do this. Um, could go with that, that, and maybe that, whatever looks 
looks the neatest. Okay, this is going to get onto two pages. You don't have to be too pedantic about double bars at the left. In fact, quite often when I'm conducting, it's better to have you know something start here, a new section, so I'm not turning blind because uh, I'm sight reading, turning blind into a new twitty or solo that I didn't have time to mark up. Because quite often, yeah, I, I'm, we're sight reading when we're conducting this stuff. All right, so uh, now I need to get rid of these empty staves. So F1, oh, sorry, F11 O will optimize it and we'll get rid of that. So now I need to get uh, system dividers in. So now I've basically laid this puppy out and it's ready to go. Uh, I would play it back. I do my playback um, in a program called Plogue. Uh, where are we? Plogue, there we go. Um, that's over here on this monitor. You can see I have a layout. Um, it's hosting a combination of Weavy and um, Garreton. Just really simple, small uh, sample libraries that uh, are just for checking notes. And the reason I host it in that and not in Finale is one, Finale becomes unstable often when you're hosting instruments, and two, uh, if you go to do this, so I'm looking at a note and then I go there, it's going to try and load every sound. And when I'm on a session, I do not need it to be loading sounds while I'm like scrambling to make a fix or, or fix, you know, change something. Um, and, and also it wastes time. So it plugs running in the background the whole time, so I can play it. You can just see. Okay, the other thing is, I have it set to just play notes. No dynamics, no human playback, none of that other stuff. It's really easy for it to get screwed up. Also, with my system of not repeating uh, uh, dynamics the whole time, it tends to screw these up a little bit because uh, it needs this information. That's a pet peeve of mine too, is when people keep pasting information for playback that doesn't need to be there for live musicians. Now I just realized there was a screw up because they need the dynamic. Okay, let's get rid of that. It's hard to do it when it's so small. All right, so there we go. Um, we would play it back, we would check it. Um, okay, one thing I forgot to do, so I've got my alto clarinet here. I wanna change the staff name, sorry, alto flute. Uh, to alto flute there, um, and then I just say alto. Uh, I don't have to put the two alto in the score, the copyists deal with that. Uh, if this was alto flute the whole way, so we wanted alto flute there, I would uh, apply the staff style, and then I don't need to say alto flute or alto because it's got it there, and that's the only instrument they're gonna play. Um, if I wanted to make this contrabassoon, I go F1, C, B, and you guessed it, if I wanted that to be bass clarinet, I would go F1, B, C, and it adds the staff style. Um, it does fix the transpositions and everything. Um, most of my work now goes to, uh, you know, a copy house, and, uh, but on some projects I have my own copyists that work, and we actually will do this with linked parts and keep everything into one file, um, which is a whole other uh, um, video on how you can do that. But right now, I think we are pretty much done. This would yeah be proofread and then sent off to copying. Uh, so I hope that made sense to some of you. And uh, I'll uh, try and do some more of these later. Thanks a lot.